He was just such a such an amazing little guy that we had to share his story. Will's whole life we had a message that we repeated to ourselves and it was about perspective. And even when Will was in hospital and, and he was going through what he was going through, we saw so much worse. We saw so many kids suffering. We saw so many families suffering. first. Your story starts first before mine. We met uh, about uh, 11 years ago. Close enough, yeah. Tw 11, 12 years ago. Yeah. Dated for four years and then we got married and we had a little girl Oakley um, who's now uh, five years old turning six at the end of May and um, I have uh, an older daughter 15. Um, she lives with us. We knew we wanted one more baby. Um, it didn't quite feel like our family was complete, so um, I got pregnant in the winter of 2011, and we told people in February. We were very excited. One more kid. We were going for the boy. Keep the rat train in going. So I had a very normal pregnancy, very healthy, no issues at all. We had our little boy, and he came out sounding very, very raspy and very phlegmy. They just weren't liking the sound of his breathing. So they did take him to the NICU and he spent a couple days at the NICU at the general. Within a few days, it was probably about four days before we had a diagnosis, we had a ENT, an ear, nose and throat doctor from Regina come and look at him and diagnosed him with laryngomalacia, which is not terribly uncommon, but I had never heard of it before. I mean, we both have big families and we'd never ever heard of this before. And what it is, is it's, um, it's an underdevelopment of the larynx. So whereas most people, the larynx is very, um, very almost hard and flexible, like a, like a ligament almost. His was very like overgrown and floppy. So it like closed in, it could close in on himself. So we left the hospital, I think, with not an awful lot of knowledge. I remember coming home and, and looking, looking online and finding information and hearing horror stories of these children on feeding tubes and surgeries and failure to thrive and then we had a very terrifying incident when he was about seven weeks old. We were thickening his food. They, they said um, thicken his food so it was harder to throw up. He started to throw up and choke on it and he, he couldn't clear his airway and I panicked. I was just frozen. But it was on a Saturday and Jason was home, thank God. And I called him and Jason came and took over and he was just level-headed and cool. And he just flipped him over and started working on him and we called 911 and... It's not like he was choking on something you could dislodge. Right. He was, his, his airway was cemented Coated, yeah. with this thick food, thick food and yeah, he just had to work it, work yeah. it through him. A few days after this choking incident, he just absolutely refused to eat and started coughing. So we took him into the ER and it turned out he had um, aspiration pneumonia, which is when they breathe in some of that, that vomit, that food. And they also diagnosed him at that point with pyloric stenosis. And pyloric, your pylorus is your, is your muscle between your stomach and your small intestine. And m I mean, most people, it just does what it's supposed to do. It helps move the food through the intestine. His was so hard and so tight that it wasn't allowing the food to go into his intestine. So it would hit that muscle and basically projectile vomit was how it came out. Again, something I had never heard of before, but it's quite common among boys especially. The biggest challenge was the pneumonia, that he was weak and dehydrated from the pneumonia and from the hunger strike. We packed up and we drove to Edmonton. We ended up 
spending the better part of 2012 at the Edmonton Children's Hospital. What we weren't expecting was the reaction out of the specialists in Edmonton. They told us afterwards that they were alarmed, that he was, and this is where we heard the term failure to thrive, he was not um, um, strong enough to undergo a surgery which he, in their opinion, desperately needed. He was admitted uh, immediately. Calendars were cleared, yeah. ORs were booked, things moved really fast. He underwent his first um, um, superglottoplasty, it was called, and they go in um, into the throat and they clear some of the uh, loose tissue that, would, uh, that was kind of floppy and preventing him from breathing well. While he had his, um, his NG tube, we swaddled him all the time, and, and so he couldn't use his arms. But the moment his arms got free, it was like he would swipe at his face. And, and as he got stronger, it became easier for him to make one swipe and, and you turn around and, and you can't possibly hold a baby's arms down 24 seven. You can't do it. You, it's, it's torturous, it would right? Torture and you can program. imagine like, I mean, the tape on his cheek, his little cheeks were, oh, they were so, so wrong, red. Dry. You could just imagine the pain of having this crazy tube on your cheek for months and months and months, right? We had this, we had this process. We had several <laughs> layers on his face. We had a protective layer for his skin. Well, first you put down the sticky <laughs> stuff and then you put this protective layer and then another layer, then another layer to keep this tube in to try. And, and the top layer was meant to have as little friction as possible. So he'd swipe and it wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't be able to wipe it off. Wow. had to keep his little hands covered with so the socks of shame. He had such a positive um, disposition. He was so happy all the time, even though he um, went through so much. He became a very social baby. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that uh, um, we, we experienced was uh, the nurses loved little Will, and he was such a flirt. And he's always smiling with his eyes and smiling at him, and they, we found out um, through a couple of the nurses that they would fight over who got Will that day. <laughs> he was just a nice little happy little guy and, and um, you know, happy to be alive, you know, happy to be. <laughs> he had these big blue eyes and these long eyelashes and, and eyebrows on a baby, like you've never seen eyebrows on a baby like that before. And he was just so happy. He was just such a happy little guy. He was going through so much, but it didn't matter. He, was, he had us around yeah. and he was just happy to be here. The month of May was amazing. He bounced back, we fed him into his stomach, he was eating baby food, um, he had his hands free, he was developing like his, some of his motor skills. Like May was just an absolute honeymoon of a month. He was starting to play yeah. um, with his sister. He would, in the mornings we would, we would sit him in his bumbo and he'd sit beside his sister and watch what she was doing and play with her. You know, he had this little backpack with his food and he had his tube so we'd work it around his toys and he had little stations that he would go to, you know, he'd have him uh, go from an exorcist to laying down and playing with his, his mobile to you know, sitting in the bumbo. And but mostly I cuddled him. <laughs> yeah. I didn't put him down very often. I couldn't. I just couldn't. And I'm, am I ever glad I didn't? So yeah, so that, I mean, we had his birthday party and... He got to uh, smash a cupcake yeah. <laughs> and make a big mess. On August the 27th, we changed his food. We went from baby formula to pediatric formula. That um, was the next step, right? We graduated, we were moving up. And the dietitian had told us that he'd um, have an upset tummy. He'd have a few extra diapers to change because the protein was different and, and it would affect him. So um, I didn't think too much of it when I had a bunch of diapers to change that night. And at about four o'clock, in the morning, um, I woke up to change another diaper, and he was on like an apnea monitor at night because we were always worried that um, if he if he would throw up and 
we weren't awake to hear him throw up that if he choked on it, we needed to be alarmed. So we had an apnea monitor from the hospital. It was alarming that his heart rate was really high, which was really weird for him because it, I mean, I didn't even know the sound. We had never heard it before. Um, and so I took his, he was really breathing, really kind of raspy and I took his temperature and he had a spiked a little bit of a fever, nothing, nothing out of control. So I gave him some Tylenol and a little bit of water and I called the health line because I thought I was worried about a seizure. I was worried about a fever seizure in a baby. And I called the health line and I said, should I take him in? And kind of talked about his history a little bit. And she said, yeah, don't, don't fool around. So I had somebody here, because Jason was gone, I had somebody here um, with me for Oakley. So I left them, I woke her up and left Oakley sleeping and I got to my front door with Will in my arms and I thought, what am I doing? How am I going to drive? How am I going to drive him to the hospital? So I went back to the kitchen, I grabbed the phone, called 911, I went back and I sat on the floor right there and I was talking to the 911 operator explaining what had happened and he stopped breathing but I laid him down on the floor and I did CPR and they walked me through it and before I knew it the paramedics were here and they took over and I never thought he was going to die I never ever for a minute thought he was going to die because CPR saved, saves lives right when the paramedics took him in the ambulance I was going to follow them in my van and um, they obviously knew that it wasn't good they said, no, you better come with us. But I really thought, okay, well, I'm gonna have to come and get the kids because he's gonna be admitted to the hospital. And I was just, so we went to the hospital and oh, I swear we took the longest route to the hospital ever. It took forever to get there. And when we walked in, one of the paramedics was walking out of the room, talking to the ER doctor. And she said, we were gonna call it on the way. And that's when I knew he was gone. <laughs> I never ever thought he was gonna die. It's um not the way his story is supposed to end. And after that, it was a blur. It was just, I think, I think I'm still in shock and it's been like almost seven months. I think when you lose a child, one of your fears is that people will forget. People will forget your little boy. You want people to say his name. You want people to remember. So our way of not allowing a story to end is Iron Will. so small You get me out of this place Tired of staring at these walls I am real One day I'm gonna be tall We play hockey For sure I'm gonna play football And I can hear daddy's voice And I can feel mommy's hand And all the well wishes for me To eat more Grow big Breathe easy Eat more Grow big The day I am sleeping It was fairly soon after we lost Will that we really 
tried to look for some good. It's so hard to think that anything good could ever come out of such a tragic loss. So even before the funeral, we started talking about doing some fundraising in his memory, in his honour. I had some good friends from Sastel, some co-workers of mine, who came up with an idea of making some Iron Will t-shirts. Will had um, a number of nicknames, but Iron Will seemed to be the one that, that stuck. We thought this would make a really great start to some fundraising for the Children's Hospital Foundation of Saskatchewan. My name is Kip Simon. I am uh, one of the co-founders of 22 Fresh and I'm also uh, a managing partner at Captive, which is a media company in town. SaskTel has been, a, been a, a client of Captive's for you know close to the same time that uh, 22 Fresh uh, started, maybe longer. So we've, uh, we've really developed some, um, you know, some relationships, some friendships. Desiree uh, worked at SaskTel and you know, with, with Will going through what he went through, you know, there was an idea thrown around internally at SaskTel. You know, apparel came up and, uh, you know, at the time we were just kind of like the, the light bulb went off over there. They contacted us and, you know, it was really a no-brainer for us. Myself, most of our, my business partners have, have young families and, yeah, you know, just to put ourselves in those shoes, it's really, um, you know, it's something that we, we really wanted to get behind and the message was incredible with the, with the full story of Will, you know, smiling through uh, all the stuff that he went through for, for, you know, for the first and only year of his life. I don't think either of us really had any idea of, you know, the, the, the scope of this. We're thinking over here, you know, getting our, our manufacturer ready to, you know, to print a couple hundred shirts or maybe, you know, 50 hoodies or whatever that might be. and then. Uh, the number came in at like over, well over a thousand uh, items. And it, it kind of exploded from there. We had these wonderful designs, these great designs for these t-shirts that they came up with. Uh, we did a bulk order, a family and friends order, where we, we reached out to our families, friends, their friends. And social media is a wonderful thing, right? We created a Facebook page in memory of Will and that kind of exploded and people started sharing that page and his story. and. People we didn't even know started ordering t-shirts through it. We asked people when they got their shirts, like we sent a letter with the shirts thanking them for supporting the fundraiser and um, asked them that if they happened to travel with their shirts to take a picture of themselves wherever they happen to be. So we've had people take pictures in, well, every hot destination any Canadian person would go to. We've got. Um, people in France, little kids in France wearing them. We've got a few folks in Australia wearing them. Um, England, I think, now. England. All over the place. It's just, it's amazing. And it, it, I think for us, because Will didn't get to go anywhere, so it's kind of taking him and taking his spirit to the beach or on a boat or, you know, so that, that means a lot to us that people have been, have been doing that. We also had some t-shirts signed by Darian Durant. He, he modeled in some t-shirts for 22 Fresh. He's one of our endorsed athletes uh, and what a year to have him on it. Um, so I, I approached him over like a you know, bacon cheddar burger. He's always been great. He's, he loves the kids and uh, that's, you know, he loves his fans. So again, for him, it was a no-brainer. We had him over here, we did a quick photo shoot. Uh, he did joke that he couldn't wear the shirts until off-season because it has Blue Bombers colors in it. Between the sales of the t-shirts and hoodies and then the just donations that different groups and people had made, there were people in Jason's workplace, people in my workplace, um, the Sastel Pioneers donated a very large sum of money. It was inspiring for me uh, to see some parents fresh out of uh, um, such a crisis like that and their initial reaction is to, you know, raise money where, you know, I wouldn't blame them if they just ducked into a hole for a year. We presented a check to the Children's Hospital Foundation of Saskatchewan in December for just a little over $33,000. I think Iron Will sets an example for us all. 
that even in the hardest of times, you can still carry on and do good. It was important to us that we do something in Will's memory for families in Saskatchewan so that they can stay closer to home. The downside of any kind of children's facility is that you need one in the first place. The upside is that there will be a better place to care for our kids and hopefully with really good outcomes. This little guy, uh, for a very short time on this earth, made a huge impact. You just can't take anything for granted, right? It's really important to forgive each other, to love each other, to um, let the little stuff wash away and, and be there for each other. We want him to keep inspiring people, right? We don't, we don't want that to stop just because he's gone. We don't want people to stop saying his name or remembering him. If you have program ideas that you'd like to see on Local On Demand, write us at max.local at sastel.com. Max Local Programming is now available online at maxonline.sastel.com.